Chapter 27, Implosion. One night in late December 1944, Ted Hall sat alone in his room at Los Alamos writing a letter. Beside him on the desk lay an open copy of Walt Whitman's famous book of poems, Leaves of Grass. Hall carefully copied a line of poetry into his letter. The letter was addressed to Hall's friend, Seville Sachs, who would take the message to the Soviet agents in New York City. Back in New York, Hall and Sachs agreed to set a meeting date using what's known as, in tradecraft as the book code. Each had an identical copy of Leaves of Grass. When Hall copied a line of poetry into his letter, Sachs would find the line in his book. He'd take careful note of the line number and then check the table of contents to see how many poems had come before this one. These details gave the date of the meeting. If the passage, for example, was from the 12th line on the page, Sachs would know to meet Hall in December, the 12th month of the year. If the passage was from the 20th poem in the book, the meeting would be on the 20th day of the month. The time and location had been agreed upon ahead of time. Army censors read Hall's letter and passed it to the post office. They had no reason to suspect its true purpose. When Sachs got the letter, he went to the main branch of the New York Public Library and took out a catalog listing courses offered at the University of New Mexico. He was thinking of studying there, and he, he told friends and was preparing for a visit to the campus. With his credible, this credible alibi in place, he bought a ticket for the three-day cross-country bus ride. Sachs arrived in Albuquerque and walked to the appointed meeting spot. Hall was just arriving from the opposite direction, and together they turned down a quieter street. Sachs reached into his shoe and pulled out a piece of paper, a technical question from, the, from Soviet scientists. Hall handed Sachs two pages of handwritten pages, everything he'd learned about the plutonium bomb so far. Back in his hotel room, Sachs copied Hall's notes onto a newspaper using milk for ink. Milk makes good invisible ink because once it dries, it can't be seen unless the paper is heated. He burned Hall's handwritten pages, tucked the newspaper into his travel bag, and got in on a bus headed back to New York. In February 1945, American forces crossed the Rhine River and began slicing into Germany. Samuel Go Goldsmith and the Alslo's team followed right behind. In the city of Heidelberg, Go Goldsmith cornered a physicist named Walter Bopp, a man he'd known before the war. I'm glad to have someone here to talk physics with, Boss said, smiling and shaking Goldsmith's hand. He began telling Goldsmith about some interesting research he'd been doing. Tell me, Goldsmith cut in, how much did your laboratory contribute to war problems? Goldsmith's expression changed from friendly to nervous. We're still at war, Goldsmith said. It must be clear to you that I can't tell you anything which I promise to keep a secret. I understand your reluctance to talk, said Goldsmith but I should appreciate it if you will show me whatever secret papers you may have. I have no such papers. I have burned all secret documents. I was ordered to do so. Goldsmith didn't buy it. The fear of a German atom bomb development superior to ours dominated our thinking, he later said, and as we obtained no real information of their uranium project in all of our investigations so far, we were still mighty uneasy. The Alsos team learned that Werner Heisenberg would and whatever work he was doing had recently been moved to a town called Heigerloch. Goldsmith had only one option. We had to go farther into Germany. At Los Alamos, Robert Oppenheimer was still losing weight. He hurried around the lab with an anxious, distracted look, sometimes not even noticing when people stopped to greet him. His scientists were wrestling with the challenge of building the plut a plutonium bomb. Since firing two pieces of plutonium together inside a gun was too slow, the only solution, they reluctantly decided, was to blast the pieces of plutonium together with the explosives, a process known as implosion. Basically, the idea was to take several pieces of plutonium, about the size of a grapefruit, all together. Explosives would be arranged around the plutonium like a very thick skin around a fruit. The explosives would blast the plutonium together at tremendous speed, creating a critical mass and setting off a chain reaction and an atomic explosion. It was a nice theory, but scientists doubted it would actually work. For an implosion bomb to succeed, the inward blast had to be perfectly symmetrical. That is, the force driving the pieces of plutonium together had to be exactly the same from every angle. 
one scientist suggested a comparison. Imagine surrounding an unopened beer can with explosives and trying to blow up the can in on itself without spilling a drop of liquid. That was the challenge of implosion. If the shock waves moving in on the plutonium were not perfectly even, some plutonium would squirt out instead of being driven in. A critical mass would not be achieved and the bomb would fizzle. Oppenheimer reorganized the entire lab, assigning everyone available to various aspects of the implosion puzzle. He gave the hardest job, that of figuring out how to create a perfectly symmetrical explosion, to a chemistry professor named George Kistowski. Kisti for short. Kisti's first reaction, Dr. Oppenheimer is mad to think this thing will make a bomb. Then he got to work. Kisti quickly realized that he would need to mold his own plastic explosives. His design called for a hundred or so pieces, he explained, which had to fit together to within a precision of a few thousands of an inch. Each piece would have to explode at the exact same time, within one millionth of a second, or the bomb would fizzle. Getting implosion right required a lot of trial and error. That put Ted Hall at the center of the action. Hall's new job was to help figure out what had happened to a ball of metal when it was surrounded by explosives and blown inward. Working in a small wooden cabin, he assembled test bomb cores that were about the size of a basketball. He hung each heavy core from the ceiling and made a series of measurements, then took the core down. Twice I dropped the darn object on my toe, Hall recalled. I did it once and everyone was very sympathetic, and then I did it again. Hall and a team of scientists took the core to a canyon a couple miles from the lab. They rigged it with explosives, ducked behind a shelter, and set off the bombs. Hall then took the bomb core back to his cabin, hung it up again, and performed more tests. The results helped to convince Oppenheimer that a plutonium implosion bomb might work. There were a hundred details to hammer out, but the basic design was set. Now we have our bomb, Oppenheimer told Leslie Groves in late February. Very few people knew more about it than Ted Hall. In New York City, Seville Sachs delivered Hall's report to his KGB contact, Antoly Yatkovs. The information was cabled to headquarters in Moscow, which reported that te the technical details were of great interest. But Hall's report also caused concern. Soviet spies worried they were being given disinformation. Was Hall really an American double agent feeding false data to the Soviets in order to make them waste their time and resources on bomb designs that wouldn't work? This is what Stalin's dreaded head of secret police, Lavertia Beria, suspected. If this is disinformation, Beria warned KGB chiefs, I'll put you in the cellar. To save their jobs and probably their lives, Soviet spies needed a second source to corroborate Hall's report. They needed Klaus Fuchs. On a snowy February morning, Harry Gold was at, at home in Philadelphia getting ready for work when he got a phone call from John, the name by which he knew Ant Antoly Yatkovs. Yatkov was at a nearby gas station and needed to see Gold right away. Gold bundled up, left the house, and found Yatkov at the station, wet and freezing. They, hope, they hopped on a streetcar and talked just loud enough to hear each other over the car's clanking wheels. Yatkov's message was short and to the point. Fuchs was in Cambridge. Gold was to see him right away. Gold jumped off the streetcar. He traveled to Massachusetts on February 21st and found Fuchs at his sister's home. Kay welcomed me most warmly, Gold later reported. Fuchs led Gold to an upstairs bedroom. He explained that he'd been unable to get away at, a Christmas as, at Christmas as planned. Things were just too busy at Los Alamos. Then he gave Gold a packet of papers, a report, Fuchs later said, summarizing the whole problem of making an atomic bomb. The papers, he said, included a statement on the special difficulties that would have to be overcome in making a plutonium bomb. Fuchs explained that he wouldn't be able to get another lead from Los Alamos. Everyone was needed for the final push to finish the bomb. Future meetings would have to be in Santa Fe. He unfolded a street map of the city and showed Gold the Castillo Street Bridge. They would meet there, said Fuchs, on this first Sunday in June at exactly 4 p.m. On directions from Yatkov, Gold tried to hand Fuchs an envelope with 1,510s with and 20s. 
Fuchs brushed the money aside. It was quite obvious that by even mentioning this, I had offended the man. Gold reported, he flatly refused to accept it. Gold apologized, picked up the money and papers, and left. When Fuchs' report re reached laboratory number two near Moscow, it was read eagerly by Igor Khrushchev, a lead physicist of Stalin's atomic bomb program. Through Hall and Fuchs, Khrushchev learned that a gun assembly bomb with plutonium would not work. This saved the Soviets from doing from going down the same dead end as Oppenheimer's team. Khrushchev also learned that it might be possible to build the bombs using the principle of implosion. Very valuable, Khrushchev said of the material provided by the KGB. Exceptional importance. There is no doubt, he added, that the implosion method is of the great interest.